some great things that are happening. I know that sometimes that Jimmy isn't that visible here in our church on Sunday mornings, but uh, uh, we've signed the papers to uh, to purchase the Okeen Church, and we have kind of this annex, this daughter church that is in Okeen called the Harvest Church, the Nazarene. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. It's a, it's a very, very young church. It's about two and a half years old. And here we are, two and a half years old as that church. And here you are as a church that is 102 years old. Okay, so look around. Do we see any 102-year-olds around here? Some of you feel like that you've been around for 102 years. Um, <laughs> well, I appreciate your honesty this morning. Uh, don't mean to put you on blast. Um, but there, there's a couple of things that I want to just bring out. Uh, uh, the this, this story that kind of resonates in my mind about a pastor that goes to the nursing home. That there, He had some parishioners that, that ended up being admitted to the, the nursing home. And he goes and he visits a few. And, and there's a lady, one lady that he hadn't gone and visited yet. And he was saving her from last because he heard uh, some things about her. And he wanted to spend just a special amount of time uh, with her because uh, uh, he hadn't really met this lady before. But she was a part Part of the church and he has been there she's been there for the the stint that he was there at the church and so he goes and she's in the cafeteria and he she goes and she sits right there in front of her and she he says how are you doing and she says oh absolutely fine I'm so glad that you came to visit me and he goes do you know who I am and she says no but there's somebody over there at the desk that can tell you <laughs> And if you're slow, I'll have to explain it, that, it's, that, that story's kind of cute because it's as if that she'd kind of gone over to the desk a few times to ask who she was. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, we kind of were, we've dealt with that, haven't we? In our own families, we've probably come alongside some people that kind of had some memory loss. We've had some people that have had some um, issues with remembering who you are like some close, close family, like your mother, like who you are, you know, um, sometimes that's, that's a difficult thing to face. Sometimes I believe that we've forgotten as a church, you know, as a, as a two-year-old church, you can imagine some behaviors that you would face as a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old. So be thinking of Harvest Church as a two-and-a-half-year-old baby. It's crawling. It hasn't, well, it's probably learned to walk a little bit by now. Um, I, I forget, you know, the, the stages here. Isaac learned to walk at almost exactly one year old, okay? Um, but that still doesn't mean that Isaac is not going to face trouble. Can I just praise the Lord? Uh, for those of you that have heard our story, that all three of our kids have had trouble sleeping, and so I just want to sit, sit here and just praise God that Isaac has slept through the night the last four nights straight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, he's clapping for the Lord, not for himself. Uh, and so he's kind of graduated to a uh, high stage as far as mommy and daddy. So if I'm, if I'm a little bit more energized today, it's because I've gotten more sleep. Um, but two-year-old, what, what, how was a two-year-old behave? How would a two-year-old church behave? There's still a little bit of a, a need for a parent. There's still a little bit of a need for somebody to come alongside of them. And so that, the, the, that if we're talking about ages of, of a church, could you imagine what a teenage church would behave? And we're thinking a little bit ahead of the curve. It's a, if it's a church, we would think, okay, this is a little bit different. But could you imagine what just a teenager would behave? I don't believe that a church that is a teenager would be that far removed from how an actual teenager would behave. The people in the church. Maybe sometimes there's a little bit of, I want to stay out late. I want to disobey a little bit. I want to break some of the rules a little bit. For that matter... If you were a 25-year-old church, I don't think that there's a little bit of a difference between what a 25-year-old, as far as the church is concerned, 
to be any different than a 25-year-old person. So you would think, okay, maybe getting out of a little educational deal, maybe getting into a little vocational deal, maybe being able to be independent a little bit more, but there's still a little bit of adolescent behavior going on. And so I look at the Watonga Church of the Nazarene and I see 102 years old. And by 102 years old, there is risks that are involved. If you've been established and been a part of a community for 102 years old, you start to see the rate of change. If we went back 102 years old and, and saw the evangelistic efforts, the people that were sharing the good news of Christ, I believe that there was a passionate, there was a, a reckless abandon that with it because the church started exploding. And then in, in the 80s, the, the certain things, they were probably 70, 70 some years old, maybe even 60 some years old, you know, not close to retirement because there's not retirement age as far as Christianity is concerned, right? You don't get to retire. Earl, because that you are retired in your vocation. You can't retire from following Christ. Okay? As much as you want. No, just kidding. As much as we want to just kind of throw our hands up and just get into this, this mode of, of coasting, there is no coasting whenever it comes to following Christ. And so you can imagine how the church started exploding and then this building is, is completed but we're 102 years old, and I, I worry. I worry for the church, as I would a 102-year-old great-grandmother, that maybe that we'd be slipping a little bit and forgetting about who that we are and forgetting about our first love, the, the one that he has saved, the one who has saved us. There are people who said, Whenever I look at, at the, the, uh, the new church in, new, in, in, in the book of Acts, there are people that couldn't help but to share the word of God. They couldn't help but to, to look you in the eye if you were a newcomer and, and that they would look you in the eye and they couldn't help but to say, do you know the Savior and who that I follow? Did you know that he died upon the cross? Did you know that he did something that, that is just completely miraculous that no other gods have ever, we've ever heard of any other gods that are doing it and not only that, that he was raised from the dead not only that he performed miracles and he showed up in my life in a powerful way because the Holy Spirit came upon me as a witness to his resurrection life and people couldn't help but to share the good news of that even whenever people came at them and said you better shut that up <laughs> because if you don't you're going to die at the hands of me as far as that's concerned. If you don't stop talking about Jesus Christ, we're going to hand you over to the rulers and you are breaking some rules and you are going to be crucified just like Christ was crucified. And you want to know what their response was? I can't help it. I can't help but to talk about it. I can't help it because it was their responsibility because Christ had come into their life. They couldn't help it. It wasn't just their responsibility. It was their natural response of a resurrected Christ that now lives in them. If I was to say to you today, 102 years old, Watonga Church of the Nazarene, that I would make this statement. I would say, we are passionate people. We're passionate at sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Would I say, would, would, I, would I hear some people here and say, yes, amen, we are passionate about that. Or would we say, uh, I think I've got a little bit of dementia. I've forgotten that that's who we were supposed to be. I've forgotten that we were supposed to be passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, I think if I looked in here, I, I would say, we are passionate people. Okay, I'm going to ask some questions here. Anybody passionate about OU football? Yeah. The most alive that we've ever been this morning is when I talk about OU football. Are we passionate about any state fans here? Okay. We feel like stepchildren, don't we? Oh, you forget about that there's another university around here. Hmm. 
I just have to say, any Texas fans? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Forget that we do have an actual stepchild from Texas that is in our congregation. Yes. We, we love you like you're one of our own, Alan. You are one of ours. So um, I wonder if I would say, as far as that is concerned, listen to your heart. Okay, whenever I say, are you passionate about sharing the love of Jesus and the good news that he, he died on the cross for you and I and he was raised from the dead and he comes to save us, save our soul, the very one in which that is the most important thing. Are you passionate about sharing that? Can you listen to your heart just for one moment? How does that make your heart beat? Does it beat very fast? Or when you check your pulse, is it like... I, I didn't get hot or cold. I mean, I, I was just like, I was indifferent. Or for that matter, did you get clammed up and you're just like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know the first thing to do about sharing the love of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't even know what to say. I, don't, I wouldn't even know how to start that conversation. Well, great. You are in a great place today. If you were there, you are in a great place today because you are amongst your peers. You are amongst other believers that probably are right there with you. And so last week we wrestled, last, night, uh, la last Sunday night, we wrestled with this idea of what does it mean to share the gospel? And we actually got to a conclusion where it was silence at the end of that discussion. And we didn't, really didn't know what to do with that. Which it also kind of informed me that maybe, just maybe, we need to dive just a little bit, just a little bit, closer into what the practices of how to share that. So grab a Bible with me, and would you turn to Matthew chapter 28? Something that maybe that you guys are, are familiar with, but maybe you just need to be reminded today. Matthew 28. And I'm going to start with verse 18. Matthew 28, 18. It says this. I still hear some pages. I'll wait for you. I love the sound of pages, by the way. Um, not, nothing against uh, the phone app. It just, it just helps, uh, helps the brother out whenever I just know. I, I can't tell if you guys are there or not on your phones, but I can tell if you guys are keep on doing this. Okay, I'll wait. Some people got their, their phones out and they said, my version doesn't say that. It says, I got network connectivity problems. <laughs> That's my version. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, I have to just say this again. Every time that you're in scripture and you see the word therefore, you have to figure out what it's there for. Because Jesus has, given all the, has been given all the authority. He has the authority to look at you and I in the eye and said, says this, go. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And finally, in teaching them to obey everything I commanded to you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I pray that it is relevant to us today, God. And I just love you today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have we forgotten that it's not the pastor that's only the, the pastor that's commissioned? If you, could I just remind you of maybe your baptism waters? Could you, could you uh, for a moment... Remember the moment in which that you were baptized. What were you baptized to? Were you baptized to the church? Maybe a little bit. Were you baptized whenever you, the image of going underneath the water or sprinkler or whenever, however method that, it, that you, uh, your parents and you had decided to do, whenever you were submerged under water and came up, were you, were you saved to the water? Were you so sinful that dirt stains was on your actual physical skin. And whenever you were buried in the water, did that dirt get washed off? Literally? 
Or whenever you were baptized, was it a reflection of what God was doing to you on the inside? Was it a representation that you have come to the realization that you were sinful? That I was sinful? That I was, as far as a sinner is concerned, I was the best. I was good at it. I was good at lying. I was good at getting my own way. And what the baptism represented is that I had no control over my sinful behavior and I needed to come to grips with that. I needed to come to grips with that and I had to submit to a Savior who was willing to die upon the cross for my sin. And not that physical dirt was washed away in my baptism water, but I was baptized because something spiritually was happening. I was reborn. I was born again, a spiritual rebirthing that I could start anew from the very beginning that Christ had forgiven of my sin and he had no recollection of it from here on out. And so what was I saved to? I wasn't saved to it to the church, although I love the church. And, and don't, get, don't get me wrong, Christ loves the church as well. But he doesn't call people to the church. He doesn't draw men to the church. Jesus' commission to you and I wasn't go out and draw people into a physical building. He says, go and make disciples. He looks at you and he looks at me and he says, go. Your commission, because that you were baptized, because that you were saved, that your commission is not to get them into a building. Your commission is to baptize believers. Your commission is to lead them into a way of discipleship. <laughs> so my... My impression of the church is this. We have a tendency to draw men into a building. We have a tendency that our focus is if I can just get them in the building. Because to be honest with you, I think that we have dementia. To think that, do it, was, it the, was it the church that actually saved you? No, it's Jesus Christ that actually saved you. Granted, I believe the church was prob probably part of the help. But if you personally are the one that's commissioning, we're not trying to save people to the church, we're trying to save people to Jesus. And so in our invitation to go and make disciples, at the very least, what we're called to do is simply to change our language. How many in here, here use the mode of your evangelism or your spiritual conversation? You know, you should come to church. You know, we would really love you. I think you would fit really, really, really good in our church. Or for that matter, if somebody would say, you know, I've got a spiritual question. What does the Bible say about so-and-so? And you're like, I don't know, but I'm going to text pastor. <laughs> that we have no answer for even ourselves. That we, we, we have a tendency to say that everything that Jesus is about, it seems like that it has to filter through the church. Whenever it's you individuals that make up the church is the one that is supposed to be pointing to, towards Christ. Instead of just having the conversation, I, just, I want to just challenge you just a little bit, okay? Here's the practices, okay? Uh, say, for instance, that you have a compass before you, and your compass is supposed to be pointing due north at all times. And say that, that in your particular evangelistic compass, north is always the church, okay? Okay? So whenever we, we, we go with intent, and I'm hoping that we have intentionality in sharing uh, with each other, say even for Harvest Church, that whenever we go in, in, in the harvest field at Okeen, that really maybe our mode of evangelism is this, come to church, come to church. I don't, you know, I don't know, but I, you can come to church. You know, how could I be saved? I don't know, but you can come to church and find out. To, to if, that is, if that is your due north, maybe just a couple of degrees, shift it. You know, we come to church for worship, right? We come together to worship. So, instead of coming to just church, why don't you just come, the degree, why don't you come to worship with me? Because I believe that there's nothing more important than, than worshiping the Savior. There's nothing more important. So you see the degree shift? Just a little bit from the word church 
pointing them to the church to, to, to worship. You know, if we, would, if we would change the degree a little bit more, if we would, not saying stop inviting people to church, but invite Jesus into the conversation to say, you know what the Lord says? The Lord says that I should love him with my, all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And out of a response out of that, that I, I just want to say, I love the Lord. Do you? Um, I think that it's, it's my responsibility because he's called me, he's commissioned me to Jesus. He's commissioned me to follow this man and not the building. He's commissioned me to follow this man that says that I, would, I should love him with all my heart, soul, and strength and mind. And so just invite that into the, what does it look like to invite him with my, all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind? What areas, what areas do you think that I'm, and you come with kind of a hat in hand scenario. Do you see the degree shift that had happened from pointing towards, come to church, come to church, to inviting Jesus into the conversation, the shift from the church to the degree of starting to talk about Jesus? I think that sometimes that we, we end up forgetting who we were at one particular time. Can I, I, I want to just throw this image up here on the screen, and I don't know if you guys can see this um, so much. I know that, I mean, this is the biggest TV as we can possibly get in this room, okay? Um, it, it won't even fit through the doors, and I know it looks super small. It looks like an acorn on this, on this stage, um, but it's just as tall as I am, okay? And so uh, I, I'm trying to help you guys out. So here's a, uh, if you can't see it, this is, I'm going to try to explain it. At one point in time, I believe that we could identify some point in our life of where we were as far as needing to be evangelized, needing to be pointed towards Christ, needing to, someone to reach out to us and share to us who Jesus is. Negative 20, on the far left side of the cross, is that you were a hardcore atheist. Hardcore atheists. Like you wouldn't, you didn't have anything to do with, with Jesus. I don't know. Maybe there's nobody here. But let me just ask you. Have you ever been there? Were you ever completely opposed? I mean, really, I don't want there to be attention towards you. Just give God the glory that you're here today. All right? Anybody here? Hardcore atheists. At one time. Not right now. I'm not saying right now. No one? Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that you didn't have to go down that, that path. So, what about a resistant non-believer? Negative 15. Anybody here ever, ever been there? Amen. Thank you for being honest. Har been resistant. Um, maybe open, but still kind of pushing back. Maybe uh, not just yet. Anybody been there? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Open to spiritual conversations and seeking. Anybody been there? How about hungry for Jesus? Been there? Can you remember a, a positive one to where that you came to the saving knowledge that Jesus loves you and there's nothing that you could have done about it? And you're like, okay, new believer, new believer, amen. What about plus 15, okay? The first steps of faith and hungry, praying for lost people. I'm at, I'm at a positive five. I'm praying for lost people. Anybody there? All right. I'm just trying to get this gauge of a 102-year-old church. I'm trying to get where we're at on this, this little scale right here, okay? Plus 10. Okay. We're getting somewhere, right? Growing and excited and you're sharing your faith and reaching out. Anybody there? Okay. All right. So we're, we're, we're kind of, the curve is kind of like this. Woo. Woo. Like this. Okay. It's okay. I, I expected this. Okay. Here we go. Positive 15. Mature and consistent growth. Outreach is a lifestyle. Uh, some of you guys are humble, I know. You don't want to be bragging, but what you're doing is you're bragging on God. God's the ones that's doing the growth, okay? You're not doing the gro growth, God's doing the growth. You've submitted to God and you followed what, what it means to follow Jesus, okay? So the curve is kind of down here. Positive 20, D dare I go any further? Can you say, Casey, I can just, you could just stop right there, okay? My, my toes are aching. 
radically mature Christian. Passionate outreach style. Anybody raise their hands? Notice that I'm not raising my hands with you. Because I think that we can go somewhere. And I think really what it amounts to is, is for you and I that we've lost. We, we've, we've forgotten uh, for some of us or maybe that we've gotten distracted. Maybe that our affection has not been geared towards Christ so much. But can I just submit something? I'm going to do something just real quick, quick and briefly before we take communion. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to, for, for, from what I gauged from majority of you, is that we're, we're on one side of the cross, okay? And that is to be ex expected. Or some of us are being a little bit coy and we're just kind of saying, where's Kaysen going with this? But for some of us, I want you to see maybe some tools. And I think just really, remember the, the Great Commission, verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 18, where he says, go. So I'm going to submit to you, remember, go, go. Okay? Um, anybody has an 80s tune coming into their mind? Wake me up before you go, go. Okay, no? So, go, go. I want you to remember go, go, okay? Obviously, the, the G-O, G-O stands for something, okay? So, what I'm going to do is simply using go, go. You are the disciple maker. You are to be going out. You are the one that are to be reaching out. Not just me. I'm commissioned, you're commissioned to go. So what am I going to bring to the table? I'm going to bring go-go. What does the G stand for? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the gospel to you. Okay? You ready for it? Here it is. G, God's love. God's love. He knows everything and loves us. <laughs> In spite of us, for that matter. He knows everything and he still loves us. He loves us even before that we loved him. How do, you, how do I know? I don't know that it's just not simple enough to, for me to say, because the Bible told me so. So I'm going to go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and it says this. God dis demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in other words, what I can tell you is about, the, about God's love is that his mind has already been made up about you. And it's great news. It's great news. He loves you. He cares for you. And of course, we can combat that. Whatever scale that we were, wherever scale that we were on this, on this scale, some of us could ultimately combat this, this love, this God's love. Well, his mind is already made up for it. For that matter, can we just look at the cross? He would die for even those that would unbelieve, for the unbelievers. He would, even for those that would reject him. Right now, if you would say, if you would say, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I am not going to follow Christ. I'm not ever going to get into baptism waters. I'm never going to be discipled. You know what? Here's the reality. Christ still died for you. He still would willingly go upon the cross, even for the, some, for the, some, the hardcore atheists that would say, no way. And to be as crude as it could possibly be, still give God the middle finger. No, absolutely not. Christ still died for you. Negative 20. Oh, we still got a problem. Our problem is that sin separates us from that love from God. God still, God still reaches out and he still would love you and he would still die upon the cross. But our problem is, is that sin separates us. Sin separates us from this holy God, this holy love that would invite us to participate with him. You want to know how I know? Check this out. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, it says this. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Amen. Nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, your iniquities, my iniquities, has separated you from your God. Your sins has hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's our problem. Own it. I got a sin problem. There's nothing that I can do about it. I got good news for you though. G, God's solution. He offers grace through Jesus Christ on the death of the cross. G-O, G. 
It says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. It says, his righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who would believe. It's through Jesus Christ. There's no difference for all have sinned. Let me say, we love, we love verse 23. We skip over verse 22. It, com it puts it in a complete, we, we love quoting, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, I can relate with that. If we stay right there, we have to go back to our problem. This is our problem. We forget about the solution. And really, what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 3 is the solution. It's not about the problem. It's about the, the solution for the problem. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Because there's no difference. For all who believe, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, all of us need this righteousness that comes to the faith of Jesus Christ. All of us need that. It's not, it's not owning, I'm a sinner. It's owning, I need a savior. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. It's his solution. It's not our problem anymore. It's upon him. It's upon the cross who saved us. So very, very finally, the O is our response. Accept his offer of grace and follow him. Did you not hear it even in the Great Commission? Baptizing people is a, is a way and a response of submission to this grace. This grace that we could not earn. It was freely given to you and I. And it's not a dependency thing. It's, it's an absolute, I'm dependent upon that, but it is a freedom thing. No more do I have to walk in this because now I walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And here's what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 5 through 6. It says, through him, for his name's sake, we receive grace as apostleship to call people from among the, all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Can I just point this out just a little bit, okay? One, is that... We are, um, we are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And our response is this. <laughs> Ob obedience that comes from that particular faith. That grace in which that is bestowed upon us is the obedience that comes from our faith in him. And who are also among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? He is calling you to belong to him. He is, has that invitation to you. And he, he's not calling you to the church. Praise God that you're here today and you get to hear that. But he's calling you to himself. If you hear something about a, a church attendance, get that away from your mind. Be obedient to Christ. He's calling you to himself. And so in the old church, the new church, in Acts, so all these people are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it seems like that there's this passion that is rising up. And so I hope this passion continues to rise up. And if you're here today, and if you're hearing this go-go for the first, uh, God, uh, God's calling you to himself. There's this passion that we get from, from the New Testament in the book of Acts where, where one of the believers kind of gets to the end of himself and he says... And now what? What are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized and wash your sins away. Calling on his name. What are you waiting for? This God that calls you and I, this passion that is rising up in you and I, the call is to, what are you waiting on? There's no need to wait. For that matter, his grace was enough for you yesterday. For that matter, your grace, his grace was enough for you whenever you were five years old. And so where are you at today on the scale? What are you waiting for? It's time for us to respond. It's time for us to respond. I'm going to ask Corey to come up and he's going to play a song. It's called Give Me Jesus. 
And as he's kind of preparing the way, it's just kind of kind of been be me and him. And I, I just, I want to just gauge again our temperature. I want to gauge our barometer. <laughs> if you would just close your eyes and, and bow your heads, I'm going to ask for two things. You can shut the, the camera off. No Facebook Live, no, no recording at this point in time. But if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes, this is a call for...